Hey friends, this is Carter and welcome to this episode of Making It Up, the conversation series where I get to sit down and chat with other writers. Uh, so first things first, I just want to kind of uh, let you all know for any aspiring or struggling or even uh, well-established writers out there, I am now offering uh, one-on-one co- coaching and mentoring um, where I can help you with your manuscript. I can give you advice about writing. I can give you uh, advice about uh, navigating the publishing industry. Um, so you can find out all the details of what coaching can entail with me on my website at carterwilson.com. And you could reach out to me and, uh, I get free consultations. So we can just, uh, jump on a zoom call and just chat for a few minutes and see if coaching is right for you. Uh, but that is something I've been doing for a while, but I'm now trying to, uh, put out there a little bit more and, and build a client list because it's honestly, it's a lot of fun. I love I love uh, reading other people's work. I love you know seeing how their minds work, as you can evidence by this podcast. And uh, it's um, it's fun for me to do that. So uh, if that's something that's interesting to you, check it out. So on with the show. You know, most guests that I talk to, I don't know. Um, some of them I do. Some of them I, I, I've known for a while. Um, but I had the pleasure today of talking to somebody who I've gotten to know a little bit over the over the last few years. Um, Abbott Kaler is on the show today. So Abbott, uh, I met when we were both giving um, lectures at a um, literary festival or something like that up in Aspen, uh, Colorado, a few years ago, probably, oh, geez, 2019, maybe. Um, now and I, I'm not even remembering at this point. Um, I don't, I think it was pre-pandemic. And she had written, uh, had just released The Ghosts of Eden Park, a uh, narrative nonfiction about uh, uh, the bootlegger George Remus. And she gave her presentation, and I was immediately fascinated by what she had written. And I immediately <laughs> devoured that book, and it was fantastic. And so we've kind of kept in touch from time to time. She lives out in New York. And she has, uh, then she decided to turn her attention at least temporarily from writing narrative nonfiction, um, you know, for which she became a New York Times bestselling author and and write her first novel, uh, which is coming out in January uh, 2024. And it's called Where You End. And I'll just, you know, kill the suspense right now. It's fucking fantastic. It's a great book. So I highly uh, um, suggest that you check it out. And so I was you know, when, when she agreed to be on the show, I'm like, oh, this will be an interesting conversation about what made you shift into non into fiction. What were the struggles? What things were easier than you expected? How did it all turn out in your opinion? Uh, what was the, the, the publishing experience like? So we had, we had a really great conversation and, um, she is immensely talented and, you know, one of the things that I we kind of talked about was with with this novel in particular, that it's it's just a highly, highly original piece of work, um, which is harder to find these days, I think, where you you know open up a book and you start reading. And you're like, OK, this is kind of forcing me to read every word because there's stuff going on here that's surprising to me. It's more intriguing than I maybe had a bias uh, assuming it would be. Uh, and so her book, Where You In, definitely is one of the most original uh, works that you'll read in a long time. And it's kind of kind of book that definitely sticks with you. So um, it's kind of annoying. She's just like hugely talented and successful at whatever she does. So uh, we all get to kind of look from the outside and be jealous. Um, but um, and a great conversation we had and, and a really <laughs> bizarre story we made up at the end. So uh, a, a wonderful uh, interview all around. I hope you enjoy, and I think you will. This is my conversation with Abbott Kaler. He might jump over to YouTube and say, I really want to check out this red room, uh, the red rum. I was actually thinking of getting a red rum sign to put above the door. Like You 100% should. So that when I'm on Zoom calls, it will, 
But do I want it to spell out murder or do I want it to spell out red rum is the question. I have wine glasses that say red rum. So when you look at it from behind, it says murder. And they're... Oh, that's very cool. Because the the Stanley Hotel, which is the the basis of that, uh, The Shining, where Stephen King stayed and was inspired, is half an hour from where I live up in the mountains. Oh, so I, I yeah, so I go up I and I... And, Shame on me, I haven't in a few years, but I would go up once a year for a, a, a writing retreat and they have eight rooms that are designated haunted. And so I I made a journey to stay the night at every one of those rooms and I finally did in 2020. So uh, it's- uh, Oh, that's amazing. It's a great you place. you have any supernatural experiences? I did. I had very small things, but things that were completely inexplicable. Like I literally had a lens cap, a black lens cap go missing that I had- laid on top of this bed that was a made bed, went and used the bathroom, came back, and it was gone. Like, I'm talking three minutes. And it was like sitting, yeah, stupid little things like that. Yeah. Um, but but nothing <laughs> nothing horrifying. But they, what's cool is you walk in there, and they're just, the TV's on, and they had the shining going on a loop. Uh, in, oh, you're in kidding room. me. <laughs> in, in all of the rooms? But I, I, at least the haunted ones. They lean into it hard because it's such a good yeah. source of, of, of revenue for them. Right. Um, so so how are you? I, I know you recently- Writing a retreat there. That sounds like a lot of fun, actually. I know you recently had uh, surgery. Yes. I have a bionic knee now. It is nice. fully, fully bionic. Um and it feels a little weird. I'm not going to be honest. It's, I, I mean, I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to be honest either, but <laughs> it's, I'm not going to lie. It feels a little weird. And that was I, just a gen- yeah. degenerative thing or an accident or something or? Oh, I have, I was a sports freak in high school when I oh. injured at playing sports and never properly got it fixed because back in the olden days, if you tore your ACL, they were like, oh, don't worry about it. Right. You're going to get college scholarship to, you know, or you're going to play professional sports. Um, oh God, I should probably shut my email off right here. Let me do that. So sorry. You're good. Okay. Just shut my email off. Um, so yeah, I just continued to play sports like a maniac and just got worse and worse. And they kept putting cadaver bits in it. I had basically like three different cadaver bits in it at one time. Um, talk about feeling haunted. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Do you start to think about who that person is, making up stories in your head about... Oh, I totally did. In fact, I was pretty young when I had my first one put in, and my doctor at the time was just like, oh my God, it was a gorgeous ligament. Like, he got really in and was like, it was the most gorgeous ligament I've ever seen. cool... (laughs) <laughs> yeah, then I was just going like, like, did it come from an adult? Like, did it come from some bodybuilder? Like, did I right. get some like, like right. crazy god, great god of a ligament? You yeah. <laughs> know, right. And then if it's such a great ligament, like, well, why? So does that mean they're young? Why did they die? How did they yeah. die? I'm guessing like too much protein powder. Right. So. <laughs> right. Right. Um, no, it could have been gorier than that. Um, but but I definitely was thinking about all the various scenarios of people who whose parts were living in my body. Yeah. Well, how could how time. couldn't you? So you're yeah. you're on Long Island, right? Right now I am. Yeah. yeah. So I, I have a place in the city, and then I have this is like my happy place out here. And so I, and, and where did you, where did you grow up? In Philly. In Philly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then so I'm I'm curious. You know, because I want to go through kind of your, the progression of your writing journey. Um, but I'm I'm always curious about, the, you know, childhood and oh, God. And, and what was wrong with you? <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> what, what kind of weird parents did you have? Um, but I'm always so curious about what that inception um, or the precipitation of either creativity or an active um, direction towards writing, where that comes from. And, you know, I've obviously talked to a lot of people and it's, it's always different, but there's always these, these, these through lines. Um, yeah. Do you have memories of like growing up in Philly and feeling like you were maybe more creative than the other kids or that you oh, yes. were like, a I, I, I think so. I mean, I read, for, uh, I mean, I guess as all writers do, right, started reading at a very young age. And I, um, and, and, you know, as soon as I started reading, I started gravitating toward like weirder, weirder stuff. I mean, I think I was reading Ellery Queen and Alfred Mm -hmm. Hitchcock before Mm -hmm. I was 10, the Mm -hmm. mystery magazines. 
And my mom says I used to go around like, well, I, I think, you know, I would start to write my own books and like draw pictures where people were getting murdered. And like, mm-hmm. I would try to illustrate the stories I was reading. <laughs> and, you know, of course, my mother, I don't know why she didn't take me to therapy. <laughs> um, you know, it was, it was, it was kind of, uh, you know, I would, I would like to just try to maybe add on to the stories I was reading too, or write different, different points of view from the, from the, you know, whoever the characters were in the story, I would try to think, oh, well, let me see what this person might have been thinking and stuff like that. I tried to get published by Alfred Hitchcock, Gallery Queen, when I was about 11 oh. or 12. And even at that time, I think this is interesting. Um, you know, of course, my my former name, Karen Abbott, um, I knew even as a young girl that I'd probably be less likely to get published as a, as a woman, let alone like that 12-year-old kid. Right. I, oh, that's interesting. I, I like I put my byline as like K Abbott just so they didn't know that I was a, like a girl. Huh. Um, that's and, interesting. Yeah. And uh, of course, nothing ever happened, but I, I, I just had so much fun doing it. And um, but you need yeah. to like how to sub- like, yeah, I mean, there's probably a submissions um, prompts in the magazine. But like that's that's a weird big step to take. <laughs> Right. To, to not only to write something, but then to actually like, well, how do I get this in the hands of this magazine that I love? Um, yeah. So the early, early, early on commitment. Early on commitment. And um, and I remember one of the stories. I really wish I had kept them all. But one of them was um, like a, a grandmother who dressed up as a man and was a serial killer. Uh-huh. And so I don't I know. It. So I get it was also like an early fascination with women who did subversive things, which I think carried over into my nonfiction. Well, and that's a little bit like Psycho. Speaking of Hitchcock, yeah. right, dressing up as his mother. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and I think the other thing I I would do, and my mother told me this, she's like, sometimes you would just look like you had a far away. Like she would be trying to teach me how to play catch. You know, she was trying to teach me how to play sports, which I eventually did, of course, but. Um, Sometimes I would just let the ball fly by and she would say, what's wrong with you? What are you doing? And I'm just like, I said, hark, I'm listening to the call of the doves. Really? <laughs> <laughs> and like, I would just start saying that, but I was like seven. Like, wow. I I Your mom like, okay. <laughs> yeah. I complain with the hark. That, that's not going to fly in high school sports, but I guess it's <laughs> seven. Yeah, I yeah, I pretty soon I I got over listening to the call and the dumbs enough to start playing, but um, it, I I guess it was always I was always a little uh, in my own head. Um, I don't know if you're ever you're into astrology at all. Like I think it's fun. Yeah, like kind of just a fun diversion. But um, are you into it? Do you know what your sign I, is and all? I know I know very little about it. Oh. I know yeah, because hey, I've always struggled with the idea of like, okay, how could every cancer be this? Well, well, that's the thing. It's like, and not to get too into the woo, because I really think it's a fun past. I'm not any kind of definitive, you know, indicator of anything. But um, it's it's the rising sign and the moon sign, an aspect to your sun sign that really does the personality. But anyway, which is all to say that my my entire astrological chart is made up of air signs, which is, I think, part of like why I was listening to the call it does. <laughs> so. You know, and and I ask almost nobody this question because <laughs> it's bring it on. <laughs> but it, you know, because it's a question I'm sure you've gotten a lot. It's a question I get a lot, and I don't know if I I don't really have an answer for it. But I'm sometimes I'm curious to explore it in terms of the idea of like when 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 a reader says, well, "Why do you gravitate towards dark things?" Like, what is you know? And I look back at my own life and. As, yeah. as, as far as I can consciously remember, I had a very good childhood, very, you know, boring, if anything. Um, yeah. And but I've always been fascinated by by the macabre. You know, I was I was, you know, I tore through all of Poe in college, you know, yeah. even though I didn't take any English classes in college. I'm just like, I, I just love this and I love the mystery and I love not even so much the solving of who did it, but just the 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 atmosphere of it all and and there's the there's just conflict right with any yeah. kind of darkness there's conflict and conflict drives story but I never think about that as being the reason and I still don't have a good answer to that to to that um, what I mean what where do you think it comes from for you that's a good question um, my childhood was um, I mean a lot of people had of course much worse but my parents fought a lot uh, like a lot. And, um, like intensely was 
yeah you know, chaotic yeah yeah and and um uh and my mother was you know gave as good as she got in fact she was probably the louder of the two mm. and there was always a sense of the tv was always blasting five radios were blasting people were yelling um you know it was it, it was, was just constant was stuff, like constant yeah. constant um uh sensory overload and immersion into a, a feeling where it was anything could happen um there was always an element of tension and there was also i think beneath that a sense of dread you know like sure and i think like a constant that, sense probably yeah and and i would you know i remember retreating into books and also just trying to like stifle my ear so i didn't hear the yelling but i think that um I started to try to transform that dread that was scary to me into dread that I could control and that I enjoyed. And so I think using that dread that I felt as a kid into a channeling it into a creative outlet where I'm like, well, let me let me play with dread in a way that I can make it happen. I can control how the dread yeah. um, evolves. I could control uh, how it stops. And I yeah, think I really think that that was part of it. And, and that key word there is is control, right? Because I feel like the same, you know, even though I didn't have that same background, you, exploring dark themes, you know, you could do it safely you know, behind your laptop, even yeah. though it is. And I don't know if you get into this, too, but you get you write these scenes that because you're exploring them and because you are who you are, you're like, OK, I can handle this. And and I, you write something dark and you like it and maybe you don't even think too much about it. And then somebody else reads it it's like, Jesus, that's really scary. That's really, I'm like, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't see it as that dark. And yeah. you just have to question yourself of like, hey, because I'm, I'm a real uh, wimp when it comes to like watching horror movies or, and there's something. Oh, that's so interesting. It's... Yeah. And there's some things friends of mine will write that it'll be an amazing book, but there'll be a scene. I'm like, that's my trigger for whatever reason. I, yeah. I'm going to skip this scene because it's too much for me. But yeah. I can go write about a child being dismembered and be like, look at it. Not... <laughs> yeah. All of these work, right? It kind of is. So, because uh, Do you ever get to the point where you're like, I want to see how far I can push my own limits or I want to write, I want to write, the next scene I'm going to write is going to be so deliciously creepy and it might not even stay in, but I'm excited to write it and see where how it turns out. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, I'm very fascinated by the the you know fascinated by the darkness that lurks within everybody. Everybody has something dark about them. Right. And it, it's either, you know, if it's somebody like my husband who is literally like the nicest, most cheerful guy that you Those are the most meet. fucked up people though. Right. But but, <laughs> it, but like you look at him and like he's not, but I'm just like what you know, what what is it? You know, right. what is it about you? And then you'll, you'll like dig a little bit and it'll be like, oh my God, I can't deal with this. And, right. Um, <laughs> but, but it's just like, it lurks, it lurks within everybody. And yeah. I, I think it's a lot of fun to, to try to find what that is in people. And when you're dealing with characters that you yourself are inventing, it's kind of like, you know, I, I draw a lot from the people I know. Um, yeah. And I wonder if that's partly a function of having uh, come up it, as a nonfiction writer. Um, it, it's kind of like, I, I always think the truth and the real people that, that I, that I know, um, are more interesting than ones I could, than fantasy. Like I'm not interested in fantasy at all. Um, so you probably like, and I know you do podcasts as well. You like true crime and you like the, the criminal mind and that kind of a thing. Yeah, yeah. I do. Me too. I yeah. just, uh, I just interviewed, uh, Stephen Michau, who as a 25 year old was the journalist who spent six months interviewing Ted Bundy in prison, who, and, and his, his book became the Netflix series, Confessions of a Killer, the Ted Bundy tapes. And so he would just talk about s sitting across the table, no glass in between from Ted Bundy yeah. and just talking for six. And I, to me, that's fascinating. Cause like, yeah. you know, you know that that person is evil. So now you're trying to find the thread, but it's also yeah. interesting to your point, you know, people who, you don't think are evil or you don't know anything about them and you kind of look at them and you're like, okay, yeah, let me try to figure you out because there's something in there. And that's, yeah. that's fascinating. Yeah. I think so too. I mean, and with that, I should, I should clarify too with, with true crime. I mean, I think Ted Bundy was fascinating back in the day. Like uh, when, when you really were like, how could this man have, 
basically fit in so well into it and be so well liked and so handsome and everybody thought he was this great guy and he had coworkers who liked him and everything. And now I'm just like, okay, Ted Bundy's just a garden variety psychopath. Right. You know what I mean? Like, right. is he really that interesting anymore? Like, right. I, Which is unfortunate. Like, you know, it's like, it's like he's just, there's so many of them. Do you think, but do you think that's because um, there truly are more Ted Bundy-esque characters or... It's just that the world has shrunk so much and the information is is so profound now that that we're just learning about, you know, the existence of all these people. Yeah, I mean, I I do think, of course, that there's more. um, More reporting about this kind of stuff, more attention being paid to it. Um, You know, there are the truly weird people like, oh, my God, who was the clown guy? Oh, uh uh, uh, Berkowitz. Yeah. David Berkowitz? And, and, yeah. Or no, no, that Ed, the the clown, not Ed Gein. Am I thinking of Ed Gein or am I thinking of? Oh, Ed Berkowitz was son of Sam. I I don't, I'm getting my serial killer. Yeah, I know. I'm getting, I'm getting my serious killers fixed up too. Somebody um, out there listening to this is screaming at us. <laughs> I think we should, we should have a primer before you even start talking about this. No, there was a, it's going to come to me in a minute. Um, no, I, I, I mean, I really think that there is more coverage of these people. I mean, you couldn't throw a stone at Netflix like the last three years and not run into just some psychopath. Like I, yeah. I'd have got psychopath overload, and right. it's, it's, and I, I really appreciated the turn that the conversation has taken in recent years about focusing on the victims. Um, oh, totally. Yeah, which was one of the yeah, and and uh, and thankfully people are starting to do that, and 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 you know, even in the in the context of why did the killer you know, pick these, these victims. And let's talk about the victims a bit. But it, it, it's, it's interesting because uh, there's a few points to unpack in there. One is that it's, it's, it's becoming more and more difficult as a writer to, if you are writing about, say you're writing about serial killers, what do you do? Like there it's, it's all been done. Uh, yeah. What's your, what's your angle? And there's always going to be that base of readers who will read any kind of serial killer book. I, I personally find that that's a little boring. Um, that, you know, I have written serial killers and I'm at the point where that's just not super interesting to me. Yeah. But I think also with the focusing on the victims, it's not only necessary, but I also wonder like the reason that it hadn't been done for so long is that, you know, if you're going to watch a show about victim stories, that's incredibly depressing, right? Because so many times, like these are just totally innocent people. A lot of times it's random um, and then that's, and, and it's almost easier to digest it from the killer's point of view in a yeah, way. I think you're absolutely right. I think, I think that's, that's probably the reason why, you know, it, it the serial killer cell, like sad victims, often nameless or prostitutes, people that maybe nobody knew they were missing even, or didn't right. care about them. It's, it's not, it's not an, as easy as sell. I think you're exactly right. My, um, my daughter's a junior at Michigan state and she's getting, double degrees in psychology and criminal justice and she's interning at oh, Michigan State's Cold Summer Child. I know. And she's in, <laughs> she's interning this semester at uh, Michigan State's Cold Case Unit. And oh, I just geez. I talked to her about 10 minutes before I talked to you and she just went on a field trip to go to this place where this they found um, a body, you know, back in the 90s with no head and no hands and they still don't know who it is, but they have a theory so then they went to go to visit the bar where they think whoever this person is went before they were killed. And she calls me, she's like so excited because it's fascinating to her. Yeah. Not because she's macabre, but because she loves, she loves the procedure and the understanding, but also that focus on the victims as well. And it's cool that they're yeah. giving them that Well, it's also a puzzle, right? It's, it is it's a, a puzzle. puzzle. So it's yeah. kind of, it, it's, it's, um, I mean, anybody who has sort of a curiosity about the, about the progression of things and how they happen and, and is, is going to be interested in, in, in a cold case like that. And I think that's great. Yeah. And that's the, that. that's why Sherlock Holmes was always so popular. It was because it was understanding, it was, it's the unraveling of a puzzle, um, much more so than the, than the crime itself. Um, so just getting back, did you, you know, let's jump forward a little bit. Were you actively thinking when you were going to go to college that you were going to become a writer, study something writing adjacent? What were your aspirations? Well, uh, you know, as I said, I always like to write, but I was like, I never thought you could do that for a living. Like, right. Uh, so many yeah. authors have told me that. They, they just like, you just think books just, just appear into thin air. 
Yeah, which is kind of shocking because I mean, I'm I you you think even back then, like today, I could see somebody coming up and being like, "Oh God, you can't make a living as an author." But back then, it just seemed, you know, like I like the, the yeah, like you actually maybe could. Uh, anyway, I went to college thinking that I was going to be a lawyer. Um, and, uh, and I run into, I mean, of course that was all tied up in like murders. I wanted to like in, pro- either prosecute murderers or defend right. people who keep right. the murder. I want to be a murder attorney. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> How do I do that? <laughs> like, I was just like, give me all uh. the murders. Um, <laughs> so it was, it was kind of like that. I mean, that same dark macabre sense, sensibility was following me into this law school career. But fortunately, I got an internship at Philadelphia Magazine when I was in college and was like, wow, man, journalists are really fucked up. And I get to also investigate murders. And mm-hmm. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I, um, it, and it was kind of the, uh, the idea that you could immerse yourself in somebody else's life so thoroughly for a period of time and forget entirely who you were, which is what journalism felt like to me. But so it was the best feeling I ever had in the world. Wow. Right. Um, and and, then, and I love that. And then report on it. Right. And yeah. learn how to write in a very succinct, uh, kind of to the point manner, which I think is tremendous training for, uh, yeah. for eventually writing for novels. Um, yeah. Not only that, but you get, you really understand the idea that your words are precious. Like you, you know, right. you have to learn how to kill your darlings. If somebody edits you, I'm not going to like get the smelling salts out. You know, journalists know they need to be edited. So it right. really was helpful to make that, for that transition then. And also understanding that, you know, on the other end of that, they are precious in the sense of like, you've got four inches of column space. So <laughs> yeah, you've got to right. really make sure you pick the right words. To yeah. Make- and is that what is your time as a journalist? Is that what kind of got you really thinking about you know, writing long form nonfiction? Yeah. I mean, uh, the fortunate thing too is I wasn't a newspaper journalist, really. I was a magazine journalist. And then I. Oh, so it was already kind of long form. So, I mean, I was writing, I wrote like I probably my longest, I could write 10,000 words on a very rare occasion or seven or eight. So I was already getting in the kind of long form, not to say I didn't write shorter stuff too, but the really, you know, stuff I really enjoyed was the long form. Yeah. And, um, yeah. And, and at, it, at some point I was just like, God, let me, let me try to, you know, let me find a story that's really worth pursuing in a book length. Um, and, uh, and that's, that's really what made me try to start, you know, doing, doing art of nonfiction. Yeah. And that's, yeah, and that's I, you know, I, I I met you during your narrative nonfiction stage, which I assume is still active and and robust, and you're probably juggling both things now. Um, and you know, I read Ghost of Eden Park, and I'm like, especially after listening uh, to you talk, uh, I was, you know, it it just, and I mostly read nonfiction. I rarely oh, read that's fiction. Interesting. Yeah, I just I unless I, I almost never read thrillers unless I'm being asked to. Um, it's really interesting. I always never read nonfiction. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. And I, <laughs> I I find the stories fascinating. So I really love reading your book. And I just get so, I can't wrap my head around the research aspect of it all. And, you know, and of all the, 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 the people I've talked to, all the writers I've talked to, I, I've learned that basically if there's a lot of research in your book, it's because, I mean, with nonfiction, it's because it's necessary, but it's because you love it. And I personally hate research. To me, it feels like homework. Um, yeah. so I don't usually have to research very much based on what I'm writing, but when I, but you are the, the extreme on the other side <laughs> where you are pouring through documents like this, there cannot be anything in here that I didn't have any kind of a backup evidence of. Yeah. Uh, and, and so it must be that you love it. Um, when I'm writing nonfiction, I love it. I, I will say that. I mean, there's really, you know, the thing about nonfiction, um, and it's it's kind of interesting to to compare the the strategy you have to approach with writing the two different genres. But uh, with nonfiction, I mean, the frustrating thing is the dead people don't always do what you want them to do, right? Like they're the story is written, and your job is basically just to find the details that make the story that's already written as compelling as possible. Uh, and that's the fun part. When if you're, it's almost like a detective hunt. You are going to find exactly what made these people tick to the best of your ability. Find all the quotes. I mean, if you're lucky, you'll find a treasure trove, a trial transcript where people were very detailed about what they were saying or doing or wearing at any particular time. Um, and and it's fascinating. And and you know, the thing about nonfiction too is you can't write bad dialogue. 
right? Like, right, right. If, if there's bad dialogue, it's because the people were speaking for, like, and the people didn't have a good conversation, but you you yourself cannot write bad dialogue. Um, and so I think fiction is actually a lot harder. Um, I, I find that, I mean, I, I wouldn't know because I've never tried nonfiction, but you, I always think about these things about, you know, you obviously you have a responsibility to the families of, or the descendants of any party. Um, I mean, you can't be beholden to them, but you have to be aware of how that's going to be received. And I suppose- Most of them are long dead and they just don't care. Like <laughs> well, that's good. doing nonfiction about live people is a, is a minefield like, that, no, I, that I try to avoid. Yeah. And then I would think you have to act like a detective as well in the sense that you know the narrative that would be interesting. You know the narrative that would be fascinating to make your story wonderful, but you have to avoid using the evidence you find to build that narrative, right? Yeah. You have to have the narrative as it just exposes itself to you rather than you having an influence on it. Exactly. And I, I you know, you look at a book like um, Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, which is a wonderful nonfiction book. I assume you probably read it a long time ago. Everybody read the book. Yeah. Um, but I was so disappointed to learn after the fact that he he switched the timing of some events and switched some details to make the narrative flow in a way he wanted to. And like you, I don't think he would get away with it today. You can't you can't manipulate it like that. It's it's yeah. kind of like um, I would have been very interested to see what what he would have done if he had just adhered to the story in the way it evolved. I'm sure he's a brilliant writer. It's a brilliant story. He would it would have been a brilliant book regardless. But yeah, that, I mean, that's the challenge. You you really have to stay within these certain parameters. Um, <clears throat> and with fiction, I mean, I think the opposite is true. You know, there's so much freedom and, and having that freedom is liberating, but it's also paralyzing. It, yeah. it was kind of paralyzing to me because um, I'm also a very, very prolific outliner for nonfiction. My outlines are often longer than the actual book. Like oh, I'm going to have 10,000 word outline. Oh my God. And for fiction, I don't know how <laughs> anybody writes a novel without outline. Like I don't, uh, are you a pantser? Oh, I, all I, I think of the opening scene and that's it. And I have no idea where it's going to go or how it's going to end. My innings come to me usually around 80% in. I'm like, oh, maybe this happens. Um, how do you do this and not go to a million dead ends and, and, and lose like, how do you, I, I, I literally can't even conceive of writing a novel without. And, I'm, and, I, and I'm just the opposite. So <laughs> if I even outline three chapters, the next three chapters, I immediately start deviating because as you're writing, I think of something more interesting. And you yeah. write it, sometimes it is a dead end. And it really comes down to just getting that draft done and it's going to suck. And then just it all comes alive in the editing. But there's, yeah, my editing is, Delete twenty thousand words and add twenty thousand words. Right. Um, yeah. Because because of those and it's painful, but it's the only way I know how to do it. Um, yeah. That's and and the nice thing too is like when a surprise when a twist comes to me, it just comes to me. I literally that moment like, yeah. what if this dude just died right now and I'll yeah. kill him? I'm like, huh, that's weird. I and you like to think your subconscious is guiding you, um, yeah. and giving you those good things, but if if you know. I, it becomes unpredictable to the readers, I think, if it's unpredictable to the writer. Yeah. Yeah. I always allow room for deviations, but I just need a basic, like, here are my characters. Here are their favorite socks that they like. To, like, I like to know who I'm writing about. Um, and I, and again, I think that's a whole over from nonfiction, but um, but but it's always good uh, to leave room for, for surprises. I, I completely yeah. agree. So what was your, you know, obviously you had a highly successful career as, as a narrative nonfiction writer. And, 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 well, New York Times bestseller, I'm going to call that the highly successful. And you choose to write your first novel, Where You End, which I read as fucking fabulous. Um, and I'm we're going to talk so about it. I, I'm, I almost never talk about books on this podcast because I just don't literally have time yeah. to read everybody's books, but we're going to talk a little bit about yours. But what was, what was that decision making process of like, okay, you know, I'm writing nonfiction under uh, um, Karen Abbott. And now I want to, under my own name, write fiction. What was that journey? Like, why did you want to make this shift? Well, if you, if you want to, if we want to go back to a sort of a calm story, I don't yes, know if the story behind my name change. Oh, somebody was dead. <laughs> yeah. Tell, tell, this is a great story. I, so this was back in like 2013-ish. 
Yeah, 2013 ish. And um, I got a, an email from a reader who said, Hey, do you know that if you Google yourself, it says you died in 2010? And I was like, No. You know, so sure enough, I, I like, and I never Google myself. I think it's just like a one way path to, you know, yeah, misery, the, yeah. The misery in, in the insane asylum. But um, I do it. And sure enough, my picture pops up and it says, Die 2010. And I was like, What? Like yeah. what? Like mm -hmm. how did the, first of all, like did somebody report me dead? Like how does this even happen? It's, what was the site that it was on? Was it like a reputable like, site? It's just you know, it, it's you know, if um, like it just popped up in the right hand corner. Like oh oh you know oh I mean? like, like the little the knowledge the card yeah yeah the little and yeah with my alma mater and died two thousand ten and your photo yeah and a photo of me and I'm just like what the f so I, I was like this is the weirdest thing um. I, I immediately started enlisting people on my quest to declare myself not dead. You know, I'm going to leave out the obvious Mark Twain and jokes. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, um, but you didn't take a second to think like, huh, how do I capitalize on this? <laughs> <laughs> you know? What creditors can I run from now? Yeah, exactly. Or like, I mean, it, I mean, it was opportunity. I could change my name and assume another life, which I guess I at least did part of that. So I, I, you know, I was about to turn 30 at the time or newly turned 30 and, um, I'm oh, sorry, not 30, 40. I'm, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm cutting off quite a bit of my age. And, uh, I was like, you know, what? I'm hitting a little bit like crisis. Let me shake it up and change my name. So I changed my name to Abbott Kaler. And at that time, I also did happen to be thinking about writing fiction. I was like, you know, let me just try to dabble on the side and I would just play around with things. Um, I ended up getting swallowed up by a couple more nonfiction projects after that, but it was always in the back of my mind. And I, I published two nonfiction books under Karen Abbott when my name was already Abbott Kaler. They wouldn't let me change it. Um, so finally, now they're like, whatever. And uh, now it's going to be Abbott Kaler in all of my books, including the novel, obviously. Yeah. yeah. And did you, did you, st are you with the same publisher throughout this? No, I, um, I was I'm with Random House for my nonfiction and my, my fiction right now is with Henry Holt. Okay. Got it. Uh, Mel McMillan. Yeah. And I know we, we, you know, communicated a few times while you were in the process of writing and then you, you seem very unsure of yourself, uh, <laughs> writing <laughs> fiction, even though it turned out wonderfully, but like what, what surprised you the most going through that process? Well, you know, I if I could just talk a little bit about the inspiration for it. Sure, you know, yeah. I, I always thought if I was going to write fiction, my, my desire to write fiction really stemmed from nonfiction. You know, I would be researching something and I'd come across these really great stories, but there was never the uh, archival material to turn it into nonfiction. The source material just wasn't there. So I'd file it away and say, wow, that might make a great novel. And I can fill in all the blanks of the research that isn't, doesn't exist. And, um, but then I, you know, I ended up watching a documentary called Tell Me Who I Am, um, which was re this really incredible story of two identical twin brothers in England, um, one of whom suffered an unusual form of amnesia uh, after a motorcycle accident. Um, when he woke up, he realized that the only knowledge he had was his twin brother's face and name. He didn't know any of their history. He didn't know anything about their family, yeah. any about their friends, nothing about the life yeah, they've lived. Very and similar, course, yeah. Yeah, and of course the twin says, wow, this is a tragedy, but it's also an opportunity. Um, this is a chance for me to rewrite our entire history and maybe, you know, give a, give ourselves a, a past and a life that we didn't have. Um, and I also thought of a lot about my parents, both of whom were twins, by the way, which is kind of weird and creepy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, my mom's an identical twin, and they had uh, a really, um, one of those really eerie twin relationships. Um, in fact, here's another story. I watched The Shining when I was a young kid, like nope. right when it came out. I was probably eight, seven or eight years old. And I thought the two twins in there were my mom and her sister when they were young. Oh, that's not, I, that's not going to leave a mark. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually said, Mom, is that you and Aunt Judy? Um, and, you know, she was like, oh, no, no, but she let me keep watching it. But <laughs> wow. Um, but anyway, that that was that was part of it. And uh, so, it, you know, again, it was like just drawing from real life. But I never thought I was going to write something that was in a more modern era. And, and of course, this book is set in the 1970s and 80s. So, you know, I guess it's kind of it's vintage. It might not be history yet, but it, yeah. it's vintage. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, I've done. Um, I'm working on my third book now. That's that's done in either the 80s or 90s. And there's something like 
there's something kind of, be- I, I think we're about the same age. There's something beautifully nostalgic <laughs> yeah. about, about writing so from, from when you were, say, 16 years old or something like that. Yeah. Um, and But then there's also all the great uh, devices in terms of, hey, there's no s- technology, there's no cell phones. Exactly. When you're in the woods, you are in the woods. <laughs> Yeah. No, that's so true. I, I, I'm kind of like, I'm not interested in scrolling on the internet. I'm not interested in people's emails. Like it's, there's just something so pure about that time period. And and yeah. And it's so much scarier. Like you get stranded on the side of the road. You're fucked. You know, you don't have your cell phone. Like, what? you know, it's just, there's always an element of danger. I think that lurks um, in that time period that doesn't today in in a way. Did you, as you're writing this book, did you have conversations um, with uh, your agent or your publisher ahead of time? Or was it like, I'm going to write this book and I'm going to try to sell it? No, I, I mean, my agent always knew I was going to try to write a novel. Although he, he also always said, friends don't let friends write fiction. Agents don't let writers write fiction. <laughs> you know, because I had, you know, been doing pretty well as a nonfiction writer and at least knew that, you know, I, I could sell a proposal and not even have to write the book yet. And it was, right. it was a, a decent way to live. Um, and I, you know, my agent also was just like, you know, I love novelists, but you really want to be one. So he tried to just sort of, and be, you know, lay the groundwork for what a difficult business it can be. And it is, I mean, it's difficult sure. for everybody, but for, I think fiction is harder in some ways than nonfiction because with fiction, it's, you, you're building on the name that you have. You, you, you know, your your style is all you have. With nonfiction, you get a new chance because it's a story that people might be drawn to the story. They never read your book before, but the, but the subject matter is interesting right. to them. Right. So, but with fiction, it's just who you are, what you've done, your body of work. Right. Um, and that takes years and years to build. Yeah. Yeah. And, and not and, much to destroy it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, but he, um, you know, I wrote this, you know, I sent my novel to him and it was still a, a rough mess, but he sent an email that really uh, sort of made me feel like I, I could at least try to give this a go. He just said, um, yeah, you're a novelist in your bones. Mm. That's what he said. So, yeah. So I don't know if he, if I, t- you know, I don't, I, I, I just let that be. And I didn't try to overanalyze that. I don't know if he meant that I, I, it's a more natural fit for me than nonfiction um, or it, I, you know, I don't know. Yeah. I, but I was like, I'll take it. I'll take it because, you know, you have to, you have to take whatever kindness you get in this business. And, sort of live off its fumes. <laughs> totally. And there's, I mean, novel writing to me is all about going on your instinct and hunches rather than, you know, I kind of eschew you know, reading books about novel writing or taking courses. Or, I mean, I think I read like two books on novel writing 20 years ago when I first started doing this. Yeah. Um, but I think it's, for me, it's better to like, as scary as it is to like, I have no idea how to build a character arc. Rather than thinking about that big thing, you think about like, well, what would they do next? Like, what yeah. would, and then balancing that with like, what would be interesting to see them do next? As a, yeah. you know, you're not going to show somebody going through their boring stuff throughout the day, but but you have to know kind of when to let things breathe, and it's hard because you get so close to it. You're like, I have no idea if this is good or not. And I feel like you're in that place right now because your book's not launched yet. I'm in the same way. My book comes out in April. I'm like, yeah. Are people going to like this? Are people going to think it sucks? And the re- the answer is there's going to be a mix. And right, are, right, of course. There's, there's, to please everyone. Yeah. Right, right. So are you, you know, when you got to the end of the book, did it feel like I did it, it's complete, or like, I have no idea if this is a book or not? <laughs> no, that's so funny. I um, So I sold it, and then my editor ended up waiting like seven months before she got back to me with edits. Which at the time was very that's kind of uh, crazy, just, and that's usually in the contract right. when that's going to happen. Yeah, it, it it was you know she had some personal issues and like I so I was giving her of course leeway to to and you know time to deal with what she had to deal with, um, but it was obviously very disconcerting because I you know at the same time, but it ended up being a great thing because um, seven months later when I opened the file again, I was like oh my god what is this? You had you a know? fresh perspective. Yeah, and I basically rewrote the entire book. I didn't I didn't oh. rewrite the story or the characters, but just 
the way I told it, I guess, and adding details and subtracting things. Was she and kind of asking for that or were you going way above and beyond the end? I went way above and beyond. Like, but I was don't... she okay with that? Because you don't well, yeah, second she was guess? Like, she was thrilled. Like, okay. I, I, you know, like, I think I just was like, I had a level of clarity about it that I didn't have in the in that beginning. And of course, hindsight's 2020. I wish I had put it in a drawer and waited seven months and then sold it. Well, you so never whatever. can unless you're Stephen King because you're like, I need to get this out the door. I want to work I on know. my next thing. It's like, I don't have the luxury of having 10 different books in drawers <laughs> for a year exactly. and a half. Yeah, I'd like to get a paycheck at some point. Right. Yeah, you know, right. I, yeah. Was uh, it was it difficult to sell the book? No, I ended up having a couple people interested, which I was I was very fortunate about. Um, That's great. And some of them some of them were like, "Oh, you know, we're big fans of your nonfiction. There's a lot of work I'd want you to do in this novel, but we know you could do it because based on what you've already done." So it it was helpful, even though I wasn't a, a, an established novelist and had never. You know, they they were kind of like, well, we we know you could do it. You know, we're familiar with your body of work. Yeah, well, I, it was helpful. You, th you think about what would have happened had you not had, if you were a debut, yeah. you know, first time writer, and, yeah, and, and then produced the same work, but you just didn't have that exactly safety. Yeah, a little bit, um, because yeah. it is so much about reputation. Um, but I think also with where you end, you know, I'm reading this book. I'm like, what the fuck is going on here? And I mean that in a totally, totally good way. I have to ask, like, what was making you ask that in particular? Because it's, you know, you, you kind of described what it was based on, which is a fascinating premise. But you have immediate, you know, unreliable narrators. Um, right. And, and, and you're trying to guess, like, is are these memories real? Are they not real? Did they actually lose their memory? Um, yeah. And but you weave through. So, the blurb that you have this is Donna Tart meets David Lynch. I think <laughs> is spot on, right? Oh, because th there's really such that was so nice of her to say. It, it is it. totally and it's such Lynchian kind of weirdness going on, which is what made it stand out to me. Is you have you know and I don't want to go too much into the book. Um, but you have all these weird things happening with them when they're younger, but very creatively weird. Um, when we start talking about <laughs> dressing up as in animal costumes, and, and and it does, you know, and it makes me think that makes me think of Sh The Shining as well, at least the book. Yeah. Um, and and that's what really made it stand out to me. I'm like, this this is a it's a good story, but it's it's got weird elements that totally enhance it. And you don't see a lot of that. Um, there's a lot of very generic mysteries and thrillers out there um, that do just fine. Yeah. When you stumble- I'm curious, can, oh, uh, after you, after you, oh no, I'm curious about what you think a generic mystery or thriller is. So, and I don't want to get into a lot of trouble here because, you know, sometimes they're, that's just the audience they play to and they're just not my cup of tea, but like a, a procedural, for example. Okay. And, Got it. Um, or like or, a cozy or something with for me. I, I wouldn't even read a cozy. Um, but like a serial killer thriller. It okay. is typically somebody's trying to stop the killer. You know, maybe the method of killing is unique or different or whatever. And the protagonist has their own demons. Um, and but it's there's nothing like it doesn't really explore emotion a lot right and i gravitate towards emotion in books like okay so how are these people feeling men. yeah totally yeah. um and and i i finished your book and i'm like that's a really unique book uh which i Thank think you I, that's the best compliment i would ever give uh, get is like if and and then in addition i liked it but if somebody told me i didn't like your book but i never read anything like it i'm like that works for me. No, I, I really, really <laughs> appreciate that. I mean, I, being if you've never read anything like it, I think I'll take that. I, that that's a, that's really nice. And yeah. It's, yeah. I'll take was it. it, what was your editorial letter like? Was it daunting or was it like, <laughs> okay, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, they're always daunting. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, she, there were some places where she wanted me to dial back the weirdness. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Don't dial back the weirdness. That's the best part. <laughs> She's like, I'll the uh, this down to like a seven. Um, I, you know, I, 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 
or I guess dial it back is the wrong context word. And more like give get build world building. I and I actually hate that phrase world building. It's it's I think it's actually more apt in nonfiction than it is in fiction, or unless you're writing like fantasy or futuristic stuff. Right. World building. Um. But if basically give if you're going to be weird, give context for it. Why why are these people weird? What, right. What is the this particular um philosophy they're following that calls for such weirdness? Right. Um. And, and that's that's the questions I really had to ask myself and, and strip away anything that seems superfluous from that and whittle, whittle it down the bare bones and, and try to keep it in what was really going on in the 70s with all that weirdness. And there was a bunch of weird shit going on in the 70s, of course. Totally, so. totally. And, and, I, and I think that's a very fair criticism because it's very obvious when you read or watch something where they make a character you know, over-the-top quirky and you just accept that that's who it is. And you, deep down, you're like, well, I wonder where that comes from. And they yeah. never address it. It's 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 frustrating that it feels a little bit lazy. Um, yeah. But I but I think- Quirky for the sake of being quirky. Like, yeah. So then, yeah. Exactly. But I think going back to what makes something generic, you know, I think even a better answer is, if I'm reading a generic mystery or, or thriller, I am- not skimming necessarily, but I know I can skim and not miss yeah. anything. When right. there's something different where you're like, all right, this is forcing me to read every word. Um, yeah. That doesn't happen all that often, to, to me at least. Yeah. Um, because if you don't read every word, you're going to miss out or you're not going to understand or you're not going to get the flavor that 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 is is so intense <laughs> that that is really what makes the book you know come alive. So and I and I had that 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 sense reading your book for sure. No, I really appreciate it. Yeah, I, I um, I, I um, you know, at at some point, I guess towards the when you get to the last of the edits and you know they're going to wrest the manuscript from your hand, mm -hmm. it's it's you get to that point where you're like every word needs to be doing something. Yes. And I I luckily I have a lot of you know one of the best pieces of writing advice I ever got was surround yourself with people who are better than you and yeah. I. I, I um have a you know a group of novelists who are pretty seasoned and read my stuff and and they're the ones who are like you yeah you know, what is this moving it forward is this moving the story forward is what is this dialogue doing do at least two things in every scene uh, and I don't know if I you know but I tried and it was just such a different way of thinking than from nonfiction where it, it's you know it's it's kind of like sometimes I, you know, you just have to have a paragraph about uh, what the Ecuadorian government was doing. And it's not right. really advancing the story, but you need it in there. And with Finnish, right. you just don't have that room and nobody wants that. It, it was an Elmer Leonard who was like, get rid of all the weather. You know, like, <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, well, yeah, you have to be pithy about it. There, there, There's no doubt. And kill your darlings. And you have to just let go. Eventually you have to be like, all right, this is out. And this is not. Yeah. And now you just sit there and you're probably right. It comes out in January, right? Yeah. So I, and I, I would say even the galley you read, there was a pivotal scene that I changed that. In that, the galley, uh, after post galley, that's yeah. a lot of editors will be like only typos at this point. Yeah. No, I was like, this scene has to be changed because it wasn't true. It wouldn't have happened that way. It's so triplets now. <laughs> <laughs> God, that would have been. Uh, I think they would have killed me, like literally. From, from, you know, uh, a third kid would really create a death. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the third one kills them both. Uh, was that was actually applauded. What the the um? Oh God, what's that book? Diane Sutterfield. Uh, anyway, um, I forget now too. But um, but you must be at the point now, like a couple months out of like um. This is right around when trade reviews start to come. It's just the worst. Yeah. It's you know, the worst. Yeah. Why did Publishers Weekly Kirkus. say? Oh, you got to, oh, good. Kirkus can be. I got a good Kirkus. Kirkus. Yeah. Well, oh, good. Yes, I guess as everybody calls them. Uh, but I got a good Kirkus um, knock on, knock on wood. So I, you know, I, I'm trying, I'm really trying not to think about that. Luckily, I, I do have a, a nonfiction where I'm deep into my edits on that. And, um, it's really helping me to. Not feel like entirely insane. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Lightly insane. Well, listen, Abby, we're going to wrap up. Before we do, we're going to do our own little storytelling, and we're going to do a special edition of the storytelling, actually, because normally I pick three books at random from my bookshelf to do the storytelling with, and this time I just picked your book. So oh <laughs> we are going to pick a random page oh no. and a random sentence, 
And I'm going to read that sentence. And that's going to be the first sentence and maybe a two minute long short story. So I'll read that sentence. You give me the next couple sentences of what happens. And obviously it can be about whatever we want it to be about. And then uh, we'll go back and forth. And, and in a couple of minutes, I'll, I'll, I'll kill it the death that it's probably going to deserve. Um, <laughs> so give me a page between one and where are we at? 315. Uh, 73. I figured it would make it extra uncomfortable for you if we did your own book. <laughs> yeah, it's super uncomfortable because I'm just going to want to tell my own story that I wrote. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, all right. I'm going to read this sentence. And you'll probably remember this well. Um, and then you just go wherever you want to go with this. Okay. A bruise purpled his right cheek. A dollop of mottled blood marked his forehead. His body looked lost inside his dingy clothes. Um, and then with his one limp leg, he takes a step toward the window and hurls himself down, but lands in a trash chute. Buoyant. <laughs> Buoyant is good. He stuck his head out of the, the trash chute and looked around. Nobody was there, but he knew that wouldn't last long. He calculated he probably had about 20, maybe 25 seconds. And with a bad leg, he wasn't going to be able to get far. So he knocks out a guy in the wheelchair that he spies on the corner and just sort of like props him up on a park bench with a bottle of brandy. He doesn't want the guy to go out without a drink. He gets down in the wheelchair and he starts speeding down. He only has 30 seconds before the bomb goes off. So he's whirling and whirling and whirling. But then one of the wheels pops off the wheelchair. Shit. Huh. His body is thrown askew on the cold asphalt. And it's right at that moment a stray dog walks up to him and starts licking his ear. Right before the bomb goes off, he can't help thinking how nice that tongue feels. <laughs> Are we still going? No, let's call it, we'll call it a day there. <laughs> He's just into having his ear licked and it just happened to be like a nice comforting moment for him. <laughs> let's add, let's add a and on that very comforting, sweet, oh, sweet. <laughs> right, right. And of course, him and the dog get destroyed when the bomb goes off. Exactly. Uh, the and dog the guy, has to live. And the guy who had got ousted from his own wheelchair raises the brandy. Right. The confirmation. As the hair toast. <laughs> Beautiful. I'm so excited for your book release. Uh, you know, I think it's going to. I think it's going to do fantastic, and it's. Um, it's it, it's truly a great story and it's original and it's hard to say that about many stories these days. <laughs> so uh, congratulations as your first foray into novel writing, uh, you had a home run. Oh, thank you so much, Carter. This was so much fun to chat with you. And honestly, I would play that game with you anytime. I don't get <laughs> meet up at a bar or something. Yep. I just can play. Yep. Like me. Yeah, oh, it, it can get carried away real fast. <laughs> yeah. Enjoy your weekend. We'll talk soon. All right. Thanks so much. Bye. So that's it. That is my conversation with Abbott Kaler. Um, I, I highly suggest and implore that you run out the door and go pick up a copy of her book, Where You End. That comes out January 16th, 2024. Um, it's a fantastic book. She was a great conversationalist. And, you know, you're going to want to know more about her because she also has a lot of great narrative nonfiction um, she's, she's a bit of a renaissance person. She can do a lot of different things. So go to her website and, and, and read all about her. She's just at Abbott Kaler, K-A-H-L-E-R dot com. And while you're out there, go ahead and pop on over to my website, carterwilson.com. You can read about my upcoming retreats in 2024, my coaching that I do, buy my books, uh, subscribe to my newsletter, all that good stuff. So that's it for now. Thank you so much for watching and or listening. This was a fantastic episode. I do say so myself. More episodes coming out soon. In the meantime, take care.